Hey folks, this is Pastor Charlie Haynes with Jacob's Well Ministries, located down in Pearl River County, Mississippi. I want to just take an opportunity to invite you to come on the internet and watch our sermons each week by podcast. If you miss some of our sermons, you just simply go on there and look back in our archives and you'll find all of our past sermons there for you to look at uh, and to enjoy worshiping with us. Well, we invite you to come back often. Appreciate you. Thank you for worshiping with us at Jacob's Well Recovery Center for Women. If you would like to make a donation to this ministry, please make your check payable to Jacob's Well Ministries, 45 Buford Lane, Popperville, Mississippi, 39470. Jacob's Well is a Christ-centered addiction recovery center for women located just south of Popperville, Mississippi. For more information, please call 601-463-0022 or visit our website, www.jacobswellrecoverycenter.com. Cursed is the man who trusts in his own flesh, who leans on his own understanding. He'll be like a bush in the wasteland and a salt desert. Like a tumbling tumbleweed. That's what I used to be. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. Trust in the Lord and in His mighty power. Wow. Put on the full armor of God. It's interesting when you... I, I love to do Bible studies, word studies. I hope you all start doing that too. But I, but I looked up the full armor and the meaning of what's meant by the full armor in the original writings. And when it says full armor, I beside it explains what they mean by full armor. So we can say, put on the full armor. It says, no, what that means is your helmet, your breastplate, your greaves, your sword, your, the whole thing, every weapon, the full armor. You can't live in this world and have half your armor on. You can't live in this world and just put on what's comfortable to you today in your suit of armor. Godly sorrow. What a wonderful thing godly sorrow is. The word says that godly sorrow leads to repentance that brings salvation and leaves no regret. But it says that worldly sorrow brings death. And uh, we've all been in the place where we were caught up in worldly sorrow. Sorry, because some man found out something they shouldn't find out or some woman found out something they shouldn't find out or the cop found out, the judge found out, the parole officer found out. It's not about that. It's about how do we feel about how we live in our life before God in Christ is what's important. And uh, I, I just, it is such a blessing to be in this place and to be able to see God really work in people's lives. It just is amazing to me. Here's somebody's life he's working in. Samantha White, come up here. Hi there. How you doing? You doing okay? I was uh, last night just seeking the face of God, and I said, Lord, I want to give this girl this award. What do I need to say? And uh, I went to bed. He didn't give me nothing yet. But as soon as my eyes opened this morning, he said, I want you to talk to her about the word halfway. And so that's what I want to talk to you about for a second. Because coming to the halfway point is a place that we stop and we use the word celebrate. 
And it is a celebration, Samantha, because you've seen them come and go since you've been here. And the fact that you're standing here stands for something. It means something that I'm being able to talk to you this morning and give you your 90-day award. So I don't want to take away from the celebration. But I want to remind you what a serious moment this is, what a powerful moment this is. When you, when you think of the halfway point, the, the half, halfway point, or half is used a lot of ways. You can say, I'm halfway there. You can say, they can say it's half-baked, half-done, halfway done. Is this all kind of ways to talk about just being halfway? A glass can be half-full, or it can be half-empty. But what really, I don't, do you ever watch football? Okay. I, that's what God started talking to me about football this morning. I guess I watched too much football last night. And he says, Talk to her about the halftime. And I want you to understand the power of this moment. When two teams play each other, in the first half of the ball game, oh, there's some passes being thrown, some runs being done, some good things and bad things being done. But what they're really doing is sizing each other up for the second half. They're going back in when the, when the halftime comes. They're going back, first of all, for rest for just a minute. But they're going to start stopping and thinking about what happened in the first half. How did they do in the first half? How did the enemy come against them in such a way they weren't expecting in the first half? And how are they going to defend against that in the second half? And how are they going to overcome him in the second half so that they can prosper? A lot of times, if you're not careful, you can go into halftime as a football team, and you might be up by 35 points, and they got zero. And you just don't worry about thinking about how to do it better. How are you going to play when you get back? It's a, I got this. We got them 35 to nothing. We're going we're gonna to mop them up when we get back out there. You know, I've seen ball game after ball game after ball game. When somebody got too arrogant and too cocky right at the halfway point and came back on the field and got their little rear ends whipped all the way back down to the other end and got defeated. Happens often. This is a powerful moment for you. It's halftime. It's time for you to stop and sit down and take a personal inventory. Okay, I'm halfway through this. Nobody ever got a book written about them for getting halfway up the mountain. Jesus will not enter with you into a halfway relationship. The devil will. He'll enter. He loves to get in a halfway relationship. One foot in Christ, one foot in hell. He, he don't matter. But Christ can't enter into a halfway relationship with you. It's all or nothing. He didn't halfway go to the cross. He went all the way. You follow what I'm saying? So it's such a powerful time. I want you to stop this next week and really take inventory. Where am I? Am I where I need to be? What is happening? What's come against me in this first 90 days? It's hindering me from being everything God wants me to be. Because you have hindrances, just like everybody else in here does. And how are you going to let those hindrances affect your next 90 days and your graduation and your righteous way of living when you walk out of this place? How is that going to be? And I just challenge you to get an inventory done and see how you're doing. If you need a coach to come in and help you, you got a whole house full of coaches, amen? You can just come say, hey, man, I need some help with this play right here. And we're going to be there to advise you and teach you and help you any way we can. But I love you, and I'm so proud that you've gotten to this place against a lot of hard times and a lot of odds and a lot of things I know must have been in your head for this first 90 days, but you're doing it. Press in. Finish well. Amen? Congratulations. Here is your 90-day Bible. Here's your award. Before I came to Jacob's Well, I was torn up. I seriously felt like I was entangled in a huge briar bush. The more I tried to get out, the more painful that it became. I was literally trapped, doing nothing but getting cut and ripped apart. And thank God that he pulled me out and brought me here so that he could start healing my wounds more and more every day. Pastor Charlie and Miss Pam, Thank you for having a burden in your heart for women like me. And Miss Susan, the day I called, you felt it in your heart to give me a chance. 
and it's truly been a blessing. So thank you. Bosh and Miss Jennifer, most of my breakdowns happen with you guys. So thank you for being a shoulder to cry on. To the rest of the staff, I truly love you all. Thank you for taking time to sow into my life. I'm grateful to be here, and I don't intend on wasting this opportunity. I'm ready to rock out the second half. Thank you. Peggy! Peggy's rocking out her outfits, talking about rocking out. You know, the, the Lord showed me something uh, just as through praise and worship, and so uh, I'm reminded of the crippled man. Uh, again, I talked about this last week, but I want to bring it straight to you. Where the crippled man, he knew he was crippled. He knew that was his lot in life. But every day he chose to go to a place called beautiful. He chose. He could have gone down a different place gone to a different church, a different synagogue, but he chose beautiful. And the one thing that I've noticed about you since the first day that you walk in, you choose beautiful. Whether it's who you surround yourself with, whether it's by the conversations that takes place with you, your work ethics, every single thing about you chooses beautiful. And so I'm reminded of the butterfly. The butterfly started off as what? A caterpillar crawling. And you're not yet a butterfly where you can fly, but you've decided all oh, hell going to break loose before you decide to crawl again. And that's what I see on you, the determination that you will never, ever, ever, ever go back. And for that, I, stand, I really do just stand in awe of you. I'm just so proud of every single thing that you've done, the accomplishments. You have a beautiful supporting family, which a lot of people don't have, and that's, that's very rare. And they're here. They called me 7 o'clock this morning, 7.15. We're broke down, but we're coming. And I was like, okay. <laughs> I think they would have got the record to drive them here if they would have had to done that. But uh, I'm, just, I'm just excited about what's going to happen now. With that said, this next leg of your race, do not sit back and relax. This is not the time to say, okay, well, this Jesus stuff worked for 90 days, but i, I got to get back to the real world. That's not the time. Now's the time to prepare yourself for the battle that you're going to have when you do graduate and walk out because you're going to have one that's waiting on you. But right now, I'm so proud of you, and here is your 90-day award. Walking through these doors was the hardest thing I've ever done. When I got here, it took me a while, but I finally let go and let God take control. I took the for sale sign off and chose to live and not die. I know that God has a purpose for my life, or else I wouldn't be standing here today. I will no longer believe the lies the world told me. Instead, I will trust in the truth of God's word. Mama and Daddy, I couldn't have asked for better parents. And I want you to know how sorry I ever put you through everything that I did. I'm going to be the daughter, the sister, and the aunt that you all deserve. Thank you for never giving up on me, even when you had every right to wash your hands of me. I love y'all more than you'll ever know. Pastor Charlie and Miss Pam, thank you for inviting me into your home. But most of all, thank you for answering the call the Lord had on your life. To all the staff, I watch each of you walk this thing out, and I'm grateful that I have such a genuine role model. James 1.12 says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. And Hebrews 13, six through eight says, so we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Remember your leaders who speak the word of God to you, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Well, let's give a touchdown applause for Julie Keene. Here, stand on this side. I want to face your parents. I want you to face your wonderful family. And uh, it, 
we're definitely going to give you the mic and give you your award. But I'd like I'd like your husband to come up here too. Give it up for Terrence. Yeah. Hello, sir. Could you stand by your beautiful bride? Can I have my beautiful bride coming up here? Because um, uh, give it up for me. Um, it's a party because we're going to rock it out, right? Amen. Um, you know, uh, I, Mandy and I uh, and, and the ministry as a whole have, uh, we invest so much in, in, in so many families' lives, but uh, it's, it's a unique thing whenever I really dive in with uh, the man of the house and with really seeing uh, the measure of the man that he is. And before I go to, to Julie and to the both of you, uh, and then I'll dismiss you in a second, Terrence, but I just want to, I just want to, it's not that we do not uh, say enough about men when they do it right. Uh, and, and I definitely want to let you know, Terrence, that you are pursuing it the right way, okay? And you're doing these, you're doing this thing called Christianity the best way that you know how. And whenever it's confusing, you grab a hold of somebody by the nap of the neck and I appreciate that because that's that's where that's where the rubber meets the road. Because you two are pioneering something that you've never done before. You're at the you're at the tree line that I talked about last week, and you're doing things, and you're and you're pursuing things that you don't necessarily have experiential background on uh, in this arena. So I want to first uh, thank you so much for choosing to go past the tree line into the unknown. I really want to applaud you for that. Uh, there was a, a text that I sent Terrence the other day, uh, and I just wanted to shout this out to everybody. I said, I just want you to know this morning, one of the many characteristics I see in you, you are a revolutionary person you, uh, who, is, who is actively participating in the, in, and advocates for the God-given rights and purposes for not only you, because it's not about us, amen, uh, but not only you, but for the ones you love. Uh, there is an uprising. Uh, shaking the foundations of generations past to present and future through God's mercy you Terrence are leading uh, a major sudden impact on not only your fam for not only your family but also for the families and lives that surround you you are a revolutionary welcome to the fight of faith Amen. so thank you thank you Terrence so much for being a man of God. I'm gonna let you step down because it's time to shine a light on on our graduate and thank her so much for for doing so many things um, we love you, Julie. You are you are you are an awesome woman of God. Uh, you know we call this place and we lift the banner over it high. This is a, a safe haven for greatness, and uh, and and you are a great woman. And uh, I'm so glad that uh, the the past is the past, and although it's happened, it does not not define us as who God has created us to be. Can I get an amen on that one? Um, there's a scripture that I shared with your husband that I'm going to share with you because this encapsulates both of you and the journey that you got before you because this is not the end. You don't get a graduation ring and you don't, you know, uh, you don't necessarily sit at the end of the road. This is only the, the foundational principles that set you on the springboard to the family life that you are so going to pursue and build upon. Uh, it's, it's funny, it's, it's amazing how an, an enemy can come in with a wrecking ball and destroy a wall or tear off a roof, but if the foundation is there, it can be built back. Amen. Right. Amen. Amen. So there's a scripture from 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. And Tommy, if you could put that up. It says, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver and gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down uh, to you from, the, from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. And I'm so thankful. I just wanted to shout out to Terrence of the day, and I want to shout loud and proud uh, that you have no obligation to the sinful nature anymore. Yeah, Amen. Amen. Uh, we, we paid it out in full and got in debt, but Jesus paid it all. Yes. He paid it all. And it's, uh, and it's, and it's going to be lived out. You are a woman and a man and a family that lives in the freedom of Christ, in Christ. Uh, and that came with a precious price, and that was the blood of Christ. And you are now servants of His, and uh, we do it. We do it by freely, with choice. Uh, and and I go on to say, Terrence and Julie, you are uh, unmeasurable. You are unmeasurable in Him. You are nobody can measure the amount of mercy and grace that God is is doing in your life and through Him. And and uh, uh, and I want you to, to. The next scripture was in Matthew chapter five. If you could throw that up there. Uh, 
the Tommy. Uh, you are the light of the world, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Go to the next, next part of that scripture, Tommy. <coughs> Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, its rightful place. Its rightful place. And when I read that scripture, it reminded me of Jesus with the woman with the issue of blood. He not only healed her, but he put her back in her rightful place with her family because of the, the religious law back then, if you were bleeding out as a woman, you were put outside as an outcast. But he not only set her right internally, but he set her right externally. And I'm so thankful that he didn't just stop with healing your heart and doing great things inside of you, but he's taking your family to a whole nother yes. level. But he's putting you on a, like a city on a hill, a light before men, that they can see, not just Julie, not just Terrence, but the light of Christ that shines so much inside of you that they can see the good works of God and glorify the Lord. So give it up one more time for Julie. <laughs> Julie, here is your graduation certificate. Here is your mic and congratulations, Thank darling. Yeah, I appreciate it. Okay, y'all know I'm a planner, so every time I took a pen to paper this week, um, he kept telling me to put it down. So I'm just going to speak from my heart and just say, you know, walking, like Peggy said, walking across the threshold of this building was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And But this time I knew it was for me because I nearly died. And I had to be woken up like that. You know, I had to have him pick me up off that street and say, walk that way, you know, go that way. And that's the direction I'm going to continue to go for the rest of my life because I can't look back any longer. I looked back enough. I held myself hostage to those things in my past enough. And I'm over. I'm done with that part. And I just want to thank you guys for everything and for opening your doors to me. I'll never forget walking in and Miss Pam just saying, take a chill pill, Julie, you know, go sit down and take a break because you're going 900 miles an hour. And I was. And the patience that you have with me is astronomical because I know I was an easy person to get along with. And I just want to say something and read a verse because this is you know, something that my mom wrote me this week, you know, um, and it just touched my heart so much, but it's from Philippians 3, 12 through 16, and it's in the message version, but it says, I'm not saying that I have all this together, that I have made it, but I am well on my way, reaching out for Christ who has so wondrously reached out for me. Friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in all of this. But I've got my eye on the goal where God is beckoning us, us onward to Jesus. I'm off and running and I'm not turning back. So let's keep focused on that goal, those of us who want everything God has for us. If any of you have something else in mind, something less than total commitment, God will clear your blurred vision and you'll see it yet. Now that we're on the right track, let's stay on it. And I just want to... Father God, I just come to you right now, God, and I am just so grateful, Father, for everything that you have done in my life and the lives of the people that surround me every day. Thank you for the people to my right and to my left for continuing to lift me up and encourage me along the way, Lord, and to discipline me like you would a child because I needed that, Lord. I needed to be lifted up that way and to be disciplined, God, so I could continue to move on and do your will, Lord. Help me to continue to run this race that you've set before me with perseverance, Lord, because you have promised me that everything that the locust took from me, you will return, and you have done that tenfold, and then some, God. And I know that everything that you have coming for me is just going to bless not only me and my family, but the people that I am going to touch with your word, Lord, because I know you've given me a mouth and an opinion for a reason, God, and I'm going to use it for your service now, Jesus. And I am so grateful for this place and this wonderful, beautiful place that you have set up and the people in this ministry whose hearts that you have allowed to be called into service for you, Father, because they are here for me and for each and every woman that walks through those doors, God. And I just put a blessing over them and their families, Lord. Continue to lift them up and encourage them, God, because they need it too. I know they suffer too, Jesus. And I just want to say thank you, Lord for every single thing that you are going to do in advance, Lord, for your kingdom, God, through me and through my family, Jesus. And I am just so blessed to be called your daughter and to be blessed to be called a princess and so grateful to be able to be of service to you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, I'm a holy roller. Yes, I'm a Jesus freak. Hallelujah. Blessed is he who is persecuted for righteousness. Amen. Just a minute. Just, this is, how blessed are we to be able to be in the presence of what God does in this place? Just amazing. You know, I was thinking that uh, last week, Asa was talking about taking inventory. Y'all ever take inventory? Ever, ever stop and just take an inventory of what's going on in your life? Do you, do you ever stop and just say, how, how, how did I wind up here? How did I find myself in this fix that I'm in right now? I, I, would, I didn't plan to do it. My parents didn't hope it happened to me. I, I just, how in the world did I get here? Well, we, we got here because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. We got here because there were some things that we believed and we operated out of those beliefs on a daily basis that brought us to the place we found ourselves in life. And the place we found ourselves is not where we ever wanted to be. And it can draw us into a hopelessness that can destroy us if we're not careful. And so I love to journal. Do y'all y'all journal? If you don't journal, you need to journal. And so I love to journal, and, 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 I, and I remember sitting down taking an inventory. <laughs> what is it, Charlie Haynes, that you believe that has put you in the positions you found yourself in life? How did your life get so messed up? How, 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 how did you wind up hurting so many people who trusted and loved you? How could that be? And then I started journaling. And I started getting real with myself. I started looking into the spirit mirror of life. And I started writing. And I wrote this. I used to believe that a relationship with God, if there was one, was going to rain on my parade. Because what little bit I did know about God and heard about God and heard about God's Word seemed like it's always telling you what you couldn't do. And most of the stuff that He didn't want me to do it smelled too good and felt too good and looked too good for me to give it up. I believed that I was smart enough. <laughs> I was smart enough to get through this life successfully and I didn't need no help from nobody else and God either. I could get this thing done. I could get through it. I believed that if I ever did need some advice on a problem, I could go find somebody just as jacked up as I was and find out what they think I need to do about it. I believed I was the center of the universe. I thought that my wife and my children and my friends and my employees and everybody else in this world ought to be stepping and fetching for me. I believed that the terrible consequences that I often found myself in due to the poor choices I was making, they were just, just bad luck. It didn't have anything to do with the truth that I was making choices and decisions in my life that certainly would lead to destruction in my life and the life of others. I just charged it off to bad luck. I believed that there was no problem, no matter how big it was, I couldn't run from. And y'all ever thought that? Well, if I can just pack my stuff and move to Atlanta, I'll be all right. If I can just get away from my husband, I'll be okay. If I can just get away from these kids, I'll be okay. If I can just get away from this parole officer, I'll be okay. I believed that the more people I could find to join up with me and the bad behaviors that I was practicing, the more that validated it. Why? Everybody's doing that. No, just the people I was hanging out with. Everybody wasn't doing it. Everybody wasn't doing what you've been doing. Just the people you're hanging out with. But then I has had something happen to me. I pray that it's happened to everybody in this room. 
It's not going to be fun to have it happen to you. You're going to be miserable when it does. But I, I finally had it happen to me, and I pray it for everybody. I reached a rock bottom place in my life. I hit rock bottom in my life. And it was then that I started to realize that what I had believed all those years and operated by was just a pack of lies. It wasn't right at all. There wasn't anything right about the way I was thinking or the way I was living or the way I was relating to other people. Nothing about that. And, and, and a wisdom came on me and God spoke to me and He said, listen, let me just explain something to you. You had not done this thing right. And your life is truly in a mess. But you got a choice. Because the truth is, the measure of your success, Charlie Haynes, is not going to be determined by what you have done. It's going to be determined by what you do about what you've done. What are you going to do this morning about what you've done? You can't go back and fix it. You can't change it. You can ask somebody to forgive you for it, but they don't have to. You can't change those things. But the truth is that what are, there's a place that you can begin to change the way you think, change the way you live, change the way you walk out your life, and begin to do some things about what you have already done that has almost destroyed you and your family and your life. It was because I got that revelation that I started to build a belief system that I have today. Y'all, I'm not perfect by a long shot. But, but my Savior is. I tell people if there's anything, if you look at me and you can see anything that's redeeming, that's decent, that is of good report, that demonstrates good character, good behavior, the only reason you can see that in me is because Christ is in me. That's the only reason. If you see anything good about me, you're not looking at me, you're looking at Christ. Because I want Him to be reflected in my life. And so I've started to take on some new beliefs. I challenge you to take on these beliefs. I believe that there's just one God. And it ain't a fancy house with cars in the garage and a big lake and a boat out back and a million dollars in the bank and a fancy woman on my arm. That ain't what it is. That's not my God. I believe there's one God. His name is Yahweh. His name is Jehovah. His name is I Am. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is the Father of my Savior, Christ Jesus. That's what I believe with all my heart, and I will not be moved from it. I believe that He is the Creator of all things. I believe that He loved me so much. Me, not some nameless, faceless crowd out there. But he loved Charlie Haynes so much in the depth of my sin that even while I was in my sin, his son gave his life on the cross of Calvary for me, for my sin and for my sake. So that rather than perish, rather than spend the rest of my life in torment, I might have an eternal life through Christ's blood shed on the cross of Calvary. He loved me that much. I believe that my Savior's name is Yeshua, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Lamb of God, the Lord of Lords. That's my Savior. And He's my only Savior. There's nothing else on this planet that is going to save me from the problems I'm going to face in life for you either, but Christ Jesus. I believe He suffered and died on the cross of Calvary for me. I believe that He died there I believe that on the third day He rose from the dead. And I believe that right now He's sitting at the right hand of the Father in heaven interceding for me and you against the devil. I believe that in His absence, because I chose to love Him, because I chose to live for Him, because I chose to receive Him as Savior, when I say Savior and Lord, I mean He's the authority over my life. I, I believe that He sent the Holy Spirit of God to me as a deposit guaranteeing my inheritance until the time of fulfillment comes. That Holy Spirit to be in me in fullness and in power to correct me, to rebuke me, to encourage me, to love me, 
to lead me, to carry me, to equip me. He's there. And I listen carefully for His voice. The Bible says that wisdom calls aloud in the street. How long will you sinful ones love your sinful ways? But we can't hear the voice in the street, and I couldn't hear the voice in the street. I was too busy listening to prejudice and anger and bigotry and lust and hatred and thievery and lying and cheating and manipulation. I was listening to those voices, and they were drowning out the voice of God. No longer will those voices drown out His voice in my life. I'm attuned to Him. I'm listening to Him. What He says goes because I know He's not going to tell me anything my Father in Heaven doesn't want me to hear. I believe that the only way to have the assurance of salvation is this. That I have to get on my knees and repent of the sin of my life. I have to accept Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior by saying that I believe that He is the Christ and that He died and that He rose again. I have to, I have to go through that. And I have to do it with an adult mind, an adult understanding that what I'm entering into with Him is a covenant relationship. A love relationship that binds me to Him. And whatever He says goes. Whoever I'm with, whatever I'm saying, wherever I'm going, whatever I'm doing, every moment of every day will be measured by what He thinks about what I'm about to do. It has kept me free. I believe that my Father in Heaven expects me to offer myself up as a living sacrifice to Him for the rest of my days on this earth. My life is no longer for saving, it's for giving away. Because that's what God expects us to do, is give away the life He gave us with the giftings and equippings and anointings that go with it to encourage and love those around us. I believe that He wants me to live a holy life life that is pleasing to Him. To not conform any longer to the ways of this world. To, to allow my mind to be transformed and renewed by the constant washing of the Word over my heart and over my mind on a daily basis so that I might discover the plan and purpose for my life and be a walking, living testimony for Him. For that reason, I determine to believe God's Word. I don't just believe in God. I believe God. I just don't believe in what the Bible says. I believe what the Bible says. I believe that I am who this Word says I am. I'm not who I tried to make myself. I'm not who the world tried to make me. I'm not who the defini definition of my life once became. But I'm who God says I am. God says that I am a man born of the blood of Christ the cross of Calvary. God says that He has a plan and a purpose for me. You know what? He has a plan and a purpose for you. He had a plan and a purpose for you before you were knit in your mother's womb. You ain't in it. I wasn't in it. And so I had to suffer the consequences of Romans 11.32 where it says God will turn all men over to disobedience so He can have mercy on them. Sometimes God has to let us have a full dose of what we want so we can figure out who we really are and what we really want from life. But I'm a blood-bought son of the living God through Christ Jesus. That's who I am. And nobody can sway me from that, and I don't want to live any other way than that. I have what this book right here says I have. Let me tell you what you... It doesn't matter how messed up your life has been, how jacked up, how deep you've gone, how sick and depraved and depraved, uh, perverted and messed up your life is. You have an opportunity to make a different choice. You have an opportunity to, to confess that, repent of it, get on your knees and cry out to God and make Christ your Savior. 
so that he might renew you and redeem you and restore you to his original plan, which is still on the table, by the way. He never took it off. I can do what God's Word says I can do. Most of my life, what kept me from being really successful was I was always afraid I was going to fail at something. And guess what? I failed at a lot. But I was always had this fear of failure on me. But when God says, Charlie Haynes, you can do all things through Christ who strengthened you. I believe that. I chose to believe it. And I chose to start doing things that my carnal mind said didn't make any sense whatsoever. And guess what? He accommodated me. He equipped me. He sent me. He surrounded me. He did, he did everything he needed to do to make sure that the plan he had on the table was put into place as long as I was willing to do it. I can do what he says I can do. As long as I'm willing to do it in his strength. And so, knowing that, I've got this chance to make a final choice. We're going to talk about Ephesians for a minute this morning. In chapter 6. Starting about verse 10. I've looked at several different translations of the Bible and found an interesting thing about Ephesians 6, chapter 10, chapter 6, verse 10, that whether it was the King James or the New King James or the NIV or the ESV or the CSV or whatever it was, the first word in verse 10 says this. It says, finally. Finally. If you get your concordance and you look up the word finally, and you go to see what the Greek word is, you know the Bible, the New Testament was written in Greek, it wasn't written in English. Right? And you go see what the Greek word that was used for the word finally. It's a word called loipon. And it means... It remains then. From this time forward then. You finally come to a place, you've done it your way. You've tried it your way. Nothing you've done has worked. You've asked for the advice of men and it's failed you. You've trusted people who said they loved you but they really didn't and it failed you. Because you kept reaching out to the things of the world and the people of the world and going by the conformities of the world. But there's a finally moment. Finally. Finally, Stephanie. It's a powerful moment. When the time comes in your life that you say, I'm putting everything else down, I'm laying everything else aside, finally, I'm going to trust God. Finally, I'm going to believe God's Word. Finally, I'm going to listen to the people that God places in my life. Finally, I'm going to start to do this thing by your way, God, instead of my way. And it's no different with her than it is with any of you. Have you got to the finally moment yet? Because if you haven't, you need to get on your knees today and you need to say, God, bring me to the finally place. Bring me to the place where I burned all my options. There's no other option for me except to come to the final moment of living for Christ and in Him in every way in my life. I love the story about Viking warriors. They used to get in their ships and they would go across the ocean and risk their lives to go to a foreign land to try to capture it. And when the Vikings rolled up on the beach in their Viking ships, the first thing they did before they did anything, they burned their boats. Why did they do that, Pastor Charlie? Because they didn't want to have no way back. They didn't want to have an option. It was win or die. It was be a conqueror or die. 
What do you want to be this morning? Do you want to keep walking in a living death, a walking dead person caught up in the things of the world? Or do you want to get to that finally moment where you burn your boats? We have girls that call us that have been in our program and they'll leave. And then we'll get a phone call, Susan. Hey, this is Sally Sue. Uh, I'm kind of struggling right now and I just wonder, you know, uh, if, if y'all would let me come back. Why, of course we would. We hang up the phone and you know what we say to each other? They're checking their options. They're, if, if they happen to have a hot pee test, if they happen to do something they're going to get caught for, if they're a little bit scared that something's going to happen, they start checking their options because they hadn't gotten to the final moment. The women who can't stay in this program are the ones who come in and start checking their options. How long are you going to stay? How long are you going to live as a mother, a father, a brother, a sister, a family member that you're still checking your options? Or are you going to take the final moment? Ephesians 6 and 10 says, Finally, from this point forward, trust in the Lord. Finally, trust in the Lord and His mighty power. Not your power, not your intellect, not your thoughts, not your options. His. Cursed is the man who trusts in his own flesh, who leans on his own understanding. He'll be like a bush in the wasteland and a salt desert. Like a tumbling tumbleweed. That's what I used to be. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. Trust in the Lord and in His mighty power. Wow. Put on the full armor of God. It's interesting when you... I, I love to do Bible studies and word studies. I hope you all start doing that too. But I, but I looked up the full armor and the meaning of what's meant by the full armor in the original writings. And when it says full armor, I beside it explains what they mean by full armor. So we can say, put on the full armor. It says, no, what that means is your helmet, your breastplate, your greaves, your sword, your, the whole thing, every weapon, the full armor, you can't live in this world and have half your armor on. You can't live in this world and just put on what's comfortable to you today in your suit of armor. Because the piece of armor that you live in is the piece the devil is going to get you with. Mm. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Julian Terrence. I hope y'all don't think the devil's through with y'all yet. He's not only not through with y'all yet, he's probably having a board meeting this morning. And he's saying, I'm getting ready to fire some imps up in this place. I'm not going to have these two people yoked together. I'm not going to have them serving the Lord. I'm not going to have them yoked back to their family. I ain't having this stuff. I had it all tore down, and now y'all done let it all get right again. Finally. It's time to stand. Finally, it's time to know who He is, what He's tried to do. And you already know how to defeat Him. You defeat Him with the blood of Christ. You defeat Him with your testimony. The power of that testimony. Because when you give your testimony to a broken, hurting, hopeless couple, that's a real testimony. You can look them in the eye across a cup of coffee and say, we've been where y'all been. We felt what you felt. We've seen what you've seen. But let us tell you the good news today. That's what this is all about. Because the devil's going to be scheming. He's scheming right now. That's what he does. That's his job. And he's good at it. So God says, he makes us an offer. He said, listen, Samantha, put on, put on the full armor so that when the devil comes, you can stand up against his schemes. He's just kind of asking you, you know, offering it to you. So you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, 
but against the rulers and against the authorities and against the powers of this dark world and against the spirit forces of evil in the heavenly realms. What does that mean, Brother Charlie? That is a verse right there that you need to stick right in your final basket. Because you need to finally understand that the war that y'all are in is not against each other. Ladies, the war y'all are in at Jacob's Well, it's not against each other. The staff is not your enemy. So why do we cut each other down? Why do we stab each other in the back? Why do we treat one different than we do another? When we all came from the same place and we're fighting the same battle. You don't war against flesh and blood. The next time that you have enmity between you and anybody, stop and say, whoop, hold on, devil. I don't war against flesh and blood. I'm warring against the evil realms of heaven. You know what I found out by experience? That usually when the devil is trying to come between two people, it's because he knows if they ever get together and they ever get yoked up for Jesus, they're going to change the world. And he just can't have it. So he's going to keep scheming. He's going to keep working just like he always does. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. First he comes and he says, Samantha, look, baby, I put on the full armor. But now, having explained to you that you don't war against flesh and blood, that it's in the heavenlies is where the battle is for your life, he's coming back and saying, all right, now, I ask you, now I'm telling you, Put it on. Put on the full armor, every piece of it. Don't leave any of it back at the camp in your tent. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, wonder when that's coming? Today. So that when the day of evil comes, you may stand your ground and after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then. I guess, I guess Asa and I are on a kick about this because he preaches about it all the time, talked about some this morning. I, I talk about it. Look, hey, men, men, are you standing your ground? Have you done everything to stand in Christ, the spirit leader of your family? Have you come to that final moment where you know that's what God called you here to do? Have you gotten there yet? And are you standing firm? I was in the Army Reserve. I went off to basic training. Went out on field maneuvers. The second Louis comes over, we're going to sleep out all night on pallets out in the field, have war games. He comes and he says, Charlie Haynes, come here. You see that, that old tree right over there? I said, yeah. He said, you see that deuce and a half right over there? I said, yeah. He said, well, this, this right in here, from that tree to that deuce and a half, that's your ground. And you're going to be standing guard duty up in here tonight, and it's your job not to let anybody come in through your ground. To stand firm on this piece that I'm showing you. And I'm like, yeah, but what about over past the deuce and a half? Don't worry about past the deuce and a half. Don't worry about what's on the other side. You are the oak tree to the deuce and a half. That's your ground. But what's your, what's your job as a husband and a father? Is to stand the ground for your family and your household. What are you letting come into your house that doesn't belong there? What is it that's okay for you to watch, but not your kids? What kind of music are you allowing in your house? What kind of video games are you allowing in your house? What are you allowing people to do on their cell phones and their laptops in your house? What are you doing on your cell phone and your laptop in your house? What are you doing that you got to go close a door like I used to and do something you were so were ashamed of that you didn't know what to do? Stand your ground, man. Because I'm going to tell you what's wrong with the United States of America today. It hasn't got anything to do with the President or the Congress or the Senate or the Governor or nobody. Else. It's got to do with men not being in their rightful place at the head of their family and protecting their families from the things of hell that are surely trying to destroy them. Because if the devil can ruin the family, he's got it licked. The Bible says, women, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. 
It doesn't have a period after submit to your husband, guys. Submit to your husband's as to the Lord. What woman would not want to submit to a godly man who is their lover and protector of their house, who stands his ground and makes sure nothing's going to come inside that house or inside that family or even inside the place he works that he knows is not pleasing to God? Stand your ground. Don't let, don't let the things of hell come into your families and your household and your place of work. If you walk into, sometimes I walk into a place, an auto parts place or somewhere, you know, and there's a bunch of old rednecks like me standing around over there just shooting the breeze and drinking coffee. And I'll be trying to buy my parts, and they're over there cussing, telling dirty jokes, dropping some bad words, you know. I'll just slide over and say, fella, if y'all can hold that down in just a minute, I'm just going to get these spark plugs and slide out of here. Y'all can y'all hold that down? I know what they're going to do when I walk out of there. Who do you think he is? Big preacher man coming here to tell me how I want. That's okay. That's all right. Because one of these days I'll walk in there and they'll all be over there and one of them will reach over and grab them and say, watch out, here comes Pastor Charlie. Because they know what I stand for. Hallelujah. Stand firm then. Here we go. With the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Ladies, that's what brought me here. That's what's brought you here. That's what brought some family members here. You don't want to know the truth. I didn't want to know the truth. I didn't want to put on no belt of truth. Isn't it interesting though that's the first weapon they talk about? Because let me tell you something. If you can't put on the belt of truth, you might as well not put on the rest of them. Because <laughs> it ain't going to work for you. But to slip on that belt of truth, to come face to face with the truth about yourself with a sober mind and be willing to confess and admit just how jacked up you really are. And not to sit there and blame it on everybody else, but take responsibility for where you found yourself. You worry about the other people later. What have you done? What choices have you made? What have you succumbed to? What have you compromised that brought you to the place? That's where you got to start. What's wrong with your thinking, not your mama's thinking? You got to start the belt of truth and I talk about it all the time have the courage to walk in I literally just walked into a bathroom and looked in the mirror but I wasn't looking at my face I wasn't looking at how I combed my hair I was looking in deep into my own soul and I was willing to say Charlie Haynes let me tell you something you are a sick perverted depraved messed up man and your entire life is a lie oh you put on a good show you can get all dressed up and look fancy and go to work and make everybody think you know what you're doing but you're dark you're so dark that you make the best looking actor that ever walked on a Hollywood stage look like Teddy Kruger that's how messed up you are inside you got to come true. you got to get to the truth. Because it's, the truth hurts. And when you get to the truth, you'll find yourself on your knees weeping bitterly, just like she did this morning. Weeping bitterly. When you come face to face with the truth about yourself and what you believe that has brought you to the place that you're in. The truth hurts. But knowing the truth will set you free. I didn't make that up. God said that. And like everything else he says, it's true. Because when the bonds of perversion and sexual addiction and alcoholism and all the stuff that was on me fell off of me, I became free to love again. I became free to live again. I became free to walk in what God called me instead of what I had made myself. And he wants to do it for everybody. Not just me. Put on the belt of truth with the breastplate of righteousness in place. Why is that important? Because a breastplate protects your heart. And if you're going to love God and serve Him, your heart's going to need some protection. 
And you got that breastplate, somebody fires that fires an arrow. You know it's been you know your heart's been shot at, but it just goes tink and it's on the ground. Man, righteousness is so important. What's it what righteousness? What's that? Just doing the right thing on purpose. Just just living your life right. Well, how do I know what that is? Read this word. When you start reading, you don't have to read the whole Bible all the way through. Start off in Genesis 1 1 or start off in Matthew 1 and start reading. And the minute you run across a, a verse in there that tells you to do something that you're not doing, get to doing it. First time you run across a verse that tells you that you ought not to be doing something that you are doing, quit doing it. And just, just walk your way through. Making up your mind, I'm going to live by this word. As I go through it, whatever I see, I need a course correction. And I've inventory and I ain't right. I'm fixing it right then. I'm repenting of it. I'm getting on my knees. I'm giving to the Lord. I'm putting it to the foot of the cross. And I'm not going to do this again. Or I'm going to start doing this again. Whatever the case might be. The breastplate of righteousness in place. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. That's my prayer for Terrence and for Julie that this morning your feet are fitted and y'all ready to walk this thing out because of the gospel of peace we overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony get your feet fitted you girls that, were, that are in this program or work in the store are your feet fitted or do you get up in the morning saying what blessing is going on in my life that I can share with somebody who's hurting and broken today in the stores when they come up to me? What can, how can I encourage them by telling them what great things God's doing in my life and in my family and how things are changing for me? How can I do that? Testimony. Be willing to give it. Be willing to stand on it as much as you possibly can. Feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to this, take up the shield of faith. Without faith, nobody can please God. Faith is being sure of what you hope for, but certain of what you do not see. Y'all might have heard me say before. One day God just came and spoke to me in my spirit. He said, Pastor Charlie, I can't use you as effectively as I would like to. And why is that, Lord? He said, because you ain't got but a half of faith, boy. I said, what you mean, Lord? He said, you sure what you hope for, but you ain't too sure I can deliver it. See, and there's some of y'all in here like this. You, you see other people get blessed. You hear us talk to you about the blessings that are reserved for you. And, and you, you, you're sure that you hope for all this, but you're just not real sure God can do it for you. Pastor Charlie, you just don't understand how messed up my life is. You don't know how deep I've gone. Even God can't help me. There's no faith in that. And the one thing that I've discovered about my faith, now I'll tell you how, how blessed I am, my faith has increased every single day that I live because I get to watch God work in the lives of the people around me. And I know He's in the miracle business because I get to see Him work it every day. I don't have to read about it. I go look at it every day. I can watch Him work, healing, touching, redeeming, putting things back together. It's amazing. And so, we need to hang on to that faith. We need to understand the power of that faith. The bigger my faith gets, the bigger my shield gets. The bigger your faith gets, the bigger your shield will get. And the less chances are that He can get to you. And that's what He talks about right here. Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. God showed me a vision of a room. In that room was a, a huge table. On that table were crossbows and compound bows, and standard bows of all different sizes, powers. And laying next to them was dozens and dozens of arrows. Every one of them on the tip was wrapped with cloth so that they could be dipped into something flammable and set on fire and shoot and burn up whatever they hit. God said, look around the wall. So I looked around the wall. 
and all around the wall were shelves. And on every shelf was a can. It looked like a gallon paint can, maybe. They were all the way around the wall. But every can had a name on it. Lust, anger, prejudice, bigotry, manipulation, thievery, lying, cheating. That was the fuel for the devil's arrows. And the devil knew that all he had to do was take one of them arrows off that table, stick it down in a little bucket of lust. Right in old Haynes' heart, and I'd be messed up because he knew I had lustful eyes. But whether it's lying or cheating or manipulating or whatever, unfaithfulness, whatever it is, he knows what lights you up. And it's the shield of faith that will protect you from him being able to do that to you. Always. Take the helmet of salvation. Why is the helmet of salvation important? Because it protects your mind. Y'all ever heard of the book, Battlefield of the Mind? This is where the devil messes with you, right here. This is not the place to have a right relationship with God. <laughs> Although there are many people who call themselves evangelists and pastors and ministers that try to have one with him right up here. Try to get as smart as he is. You can't have an intellectual relationship with God. His ways are higher than your ways. and His thoughts are higher than your thoughts. The relationship with God is a relationship of the heart. And so salvation, the helmet of salvation will protect your mind from the wiles of the devil, from the things that try to come against you. Those of you who come in here when you remember the first few days or weeks that you were here, you didn't have no helmet of salvation, and you were laying up your bed at night, and this voice come, uh, You know where your fiancé is tonight? I think God does that. That's the devil. He wants to mess with your mind. You don't get up and get out of here, boy. They're going to they gonna give your kids away. You're going to lose your truck. You're going to lose your fiancé. If you're in here and you lose your truck, you get your better truck. If you're in here and you lose your fiancé, he wasn't the one. Just move on, all right? Don't worry about it. He's going to give you a better one. Because princesses deserve knights in shining order, armor on a horse. They don't deserve a court jester. Just remember that, ladies, because you're princesses. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. What self-respecting conqueror what self-respecting Christian soldier would walk onto a battlefield without his sword? None. <laughs> well, these, these, these precious men and women are fighting overseas, and they know somebody's trying to kill them 24 hours a day, just like the devil's trying to kill you and me. They're not going to march out there in the street without their weapon, and they're going to be ready. They're going to be armed to the teeth. They're going to have all the armor on so that they can protect themselves. It's, it's an important thing. But ladies, gentlemen, this is it. This is, the, this is the weapon of all weapons. It's the sword of the Spirit. What did Jesus pull out in the temptation of the desert when Satan was trying to tempt him? He pulled out his sword. He pulled out the Word of God. You got to get this in your heart. You got to get it ready to flow. You got to have it in your heart to the point that as you begin to do things and make decisions, that the word will float up into your spirit and balance what you're doing of whether it's right or it's wrong. You can't do that if you don't get in this word and you don't stay in it. It's just too important. Anybody can own a Bible. Anybody can have a Bible in their house. Anybody can keep a Bible in their car. But is it just a Bible or is it your Bible? Is, is it filled with blood, snot, and tears on every page that you wept in the times you spent with Him there? And the answers have come that you needed to hear from there. That's your Bible. Listen. 
over in the office there's a bunch of swords that somebody donated. I could go over and get one of them suckers, man, and get me a scabbard, put that sword on my belt right here, start strutting around up here. Got that big sword on, walking around, walking around, walking around. Somebody look up and say, hey, that guy must be a swordsman. Look at that big old sword he got on. No. If I had to get it out and fight with it, I probably couldn't even get it out of the scabbard. And if I got it out of the scabbard, I never had work with it any. I hadn't practiced with it any. I hadn't spent any time with it. How am I going to use it effectively against somebody that uses it every day? How are you going to use your word if you don't practice with it? If you don't practice with it every day and become efficient with it and let it become a part of your life, how are you going to do this? You can't. Oh, you can throw it on the coffee table in the living room and impress somebody coming by for tea and coffee. Hey, look, I got a Bible. There must be Christians up in here. Whoop-de-doo. See how far that gets you. And then there's one last final thing we got to do. One, one final piece of equipment that we got to have. I don't know about anybody else, but I, even as a pastor, I guess I struggle with this as much as anything in my walk with God. It says in Ephesians, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and always keep on praying for the saints. I'm not the least bit satisfied with my prayer life. How about you? Because to not want to spend intimate personal time on my knees with God in prayer means I don't want to spend any time with Him. I don't want to hear from Him. I don't want to talk to Him. There's something wrong with a relationship when I don't want to pray. Because all prayer is, is communication with God. And if I'm doing all the talking and then walking out of the room and not giving Him a chance to say something, I have, I've lost something there. And when I'm praying... Am I just praying everything for me? Or am I praying for all those around me? Who am I praying for? Pray for the saints. And then it says this. Y'all please do this. Paul says this. He says, and pray for me. Pray for me also. That I may preach the word fearlessly. One of the things that's wrong with the church today, it's gotten so warm and fuzzy. It feels like a cat. God, save us from warm and fuzzy church. Give us churches and pastors who stand in the pulpit and preach the Word the way the Holy Spirit tells them to preach it. And if somebody gets up and walks out offended, hallelujah! If, if, if everybody can walk out of a church feeling all warm and fuzzy, there was something wrong with the sermon. Something is wrong. Because the Word is good for correcting and rebuking. Amen? So, when y'all are praying, and you're going to come here, would you pray for me also? That I don't ever get politically correct? That I'm not ever afraid to say what needs to be said, even if somebody's going to get offended by it? Would y'all pray for me? And when you go to your home churches, you want to hear a good sermon? You want to hear a good sermon? Pray on the way to church. Yeah! When I get there today, you light Brother Brown up. Fill him with the Holy Spirit. Operate in him today and let him lay it down and lay it down hard because I need something, God. You know what? It'll happen. If you go with that expectation. Y'all, come on. Burn your boats today. Lay your options down today. Purpose this day. To live your life only one way. By the Word of God. And I give you my solemn promise that you will never be disappointed. You won't be disappointed. Oh, will you be hurt? Will you be lied on? Will you be, will be, they, sure. But it'll be like water off a duck's back if you're doing it for Jesus. Amen? Amen? Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the miraculous works that you've shown us today. Thank you for the promise that there's many, many more to come, just like the ones we saw today. Because you have ordained this place, you have purposed this place as a place of healing and restoration and redemption. That's what you've done. And you're constantly bringing people here to be a part of this ministry who can accommodate 
your vision, who can accommodate your plan for Jacob's Well Ministries and the women and families who are part of it. God, I, I thank you for that so much. God, I lift up all these families to you today, and I, and I ask you, God, just to touch their hearts for the whole rest of this day. And just say to them, are you going to make that final decision today? Are you going to finally turn to me and turn away from the world? Are you finally going to begin to trust me? Are you finally going to begin to believe me? Are you finally going to give me the chance to bring you back to the plan I had for you all of your life? It's right here on the table. Are you going to finally give me that chance? God, just hound them today in their spirit. And don't give up on them until they finally burn their boats and turn to you and, and, and never look back at the world again. God, as we leave this place and go over next door and begin our time of fellowship together, I just pray that it'll be a time of rejoicing, joy, blessing, peace, and that every word that's said between us will bring a smile to your face and everything that is done will be pleasing to your ear and pleasing to your eye. Lord, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great day.